it feels a little bit like you're on a couple beers. <laughs> That's what it feels like. You're, you know, you feel normal, but then when you try to think, you don't really think normally. And the longer you stay here, the, the more you're affected by it. So, if you ask me some questions in a couple hours, I'll be a little more fuzzy. <laughs> Over there you can see some of the antenna that have been put together here at kind of the base camp before they're taken up to the plateau itself. But that's not what we're looking at at the moment. At the moment we're just off to the medical centre. This is the paramedic who's checking me. Thank you for checking me. Okay. All right, let's see how we go. It's good. It's good. The okay. black plate on the, bl the position blacks and the pulls. You can see there a couple of antenna just being finished off at the moment for delivery up the mountain. Which looks like we're going there, Pete. We passed the test. We did. Passed yes. the medical. <laughs> I feel a lot safer now. Yeah. <laughs> so while we wait for our ESO host Laura to go and get us some oxygen, let's have a quick look at the view here from the, the OSF where operations are run. This is looking away from where Alma is. And there's a big salt lake out there. That's the Atacama Desert. And that great big building there, that's where the Americans construct their antenna, whereas other antenna are assembled a bit more in the open. And head back over to the safety center here. That volcano up there, which is a real landmark of the area, and we'll have get an even better view of it from Upper Alma, that uh, that actually marks the border between Chile, where we are, and Bolivia. Gracias. So we've just been given oxygen kits because when you're up at 5,000 meters, well, you might need oxygen. Okay, so we're making our way up towards the plateau now. It's quite a long drive. There's a bit of vegetation still at this point, and that's because sometimes you get precipitation up here, although I would call precipitation rain. You're very pretty. You remind me of my dog back home. Okay, so we've arrived at Alma. There's a main building here, a technical building. Over there, look at that. You can already see the array of dishes. They had some snow up here recently as well, so you can see lots of kind of piled up snow there. We're gonna pop inside first. So we're inside a technical building up here on the plateau. You can see the array out there. I'm feeling, I'm feeling a bit lightheaded actually at this altitude. Now the dishes aren't controlled from up here. This is just sort of where people come up for short stints to do maintenance, construction, engineering. Everything's actually controlled from down at 2,900 meters at the control center we were at before. It's at 2,900 because under Chilean law, if you're below 3,000 meters, you're not at high altitude. Once you pass 3,000 meters, well, all the rules change, and I can tell why. I'm really short of breath, lightheaded, not thinking very straight. That's pretty normal when you first come up to these kind of altitudes. Oh, this is cool. If you look at this screen here, they've got the current configuration of the array. As we'll find out soon, they move these dishes around all the time. That's where they are at the moment. Now, see that guy in the red jacket? That's Dennis. He works here at Alma. And it's brilliant because he happens to be a 60 Symbols and Deep Sky Videos viewer. And when he found out we were coming, he got in touch and said he'd love to come up to the plateau with us. I'm going to give him the microphone and let him explain what's going on. There's the big beast they use to move the dishes around. We're really lucky to get to see this. There are two of those out here that they use to move the dishes around. Apparently one of the dishes are being picked up today and taken down the mountain for maintenance. So that's what that's heading out to do at the moment. Okay, well this is the correlator. This is the ALMA baseline correlator. This is essentially the, um, the brain 
of the whole telescope. This is where all the signals from all the different antennas are routed. They all arrive here, so when you come in here you'll see a lot of cables, a lot of fiber optics coming all together here. And this is where all the signals are finally getting correlated. This is a correlator, so they get correlated, which is essentially meaning multiplied. It's very powerful but very unflexible, right? It does only one type of operation. It's constantly doing billions and billions of multiplications per second, but you can't use it for, you know, sending emails or, 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 or Skyping your friends, right? It's very, very limited in the amount of things you can do. So at some point you should walk up just to, to below an okay, antenna and that's, that's when you get an idea of the scale of what 12 meters means. So right now we're inside the middle of the uh, ALMA array. ALMA stands for the, um, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter um, Array. A, yeah, array. We're at 5,000 meters so if I say stupid things I blame it for uh, to the lack of oxygen. We're surrounded by antennas, right? You can see antennas all pointed in that direction. Right now they're not operating, we're not actually observing at this moment. And, um, and essentially we're inside this big virtual telescope. ALMA, instead of being one, a single telescope, a single very big telescope, uh, they decided, well, we can't really build a hundred meter or one kilometer telescope, that's just impossible. Uh, you know, the telescope would deform and it would just not work. It's not physically possible. So instead, we decided to use this technology called interferometry of using many antennas and you separate them and they essentially all act as a single, one large single telescope. And so that's what we have right here. So we have a big telescope with a lot of holes. There's a lot of photons coming from your signal on the sky that are hitting the ground instead of being uh, focused into a receiver. So how does that work? Well, it works because we make the image in a really funny way. Instead of actually observing the signal on the sky and making the image directly, we do, and, and I'm going to have to introduce a little bit of a technical term, what we actually observe is the Fourier transform of the image. So. It's a little bit like uh, the analogy of when you listen to music and you have your, uh, your equalizer. Oh, there we go. I'll interrupt because we're starting to move the antennas and that's just really cool, yeah. Look at this Deep Sky videos. They're moving the Alma antenna just for you. We're not observing the image directly, we're observing the Fourier transform of the image. So essentially you're observing kind of the components of the image. So an image, it can have a lot of contrast, and it can have those contracts on big angular scales. So for example, on things very separated from each other, uh, you have a lot of contrast, and in things closer together you have less contrast. So that's kind of the Fourier transform. It gives you the different components of the image. And that's what we're observing in reality. ALMA observes all those different components of the image. Each pair of antenna observes one component of the image, right? And so, in reality, you're filling this plane, this, this Fourier plane, you're filling it up with all the different components, and you want to have as many points in it possible. And obviously, you're right, we have some holes, but with the fact that we have all these different kind of pairs, we call them baselines, we have all these different kind of pairs, and at the same time, you're observing your object while the Earth is rotating, and so the rotation of the Earth kind of fills in the holes of this virtual antenna. It fills in all the components that you're missing when you're observing at one particular time. And once you've filled in enough, all of these components, once you've filled in this Fourier plane, you can go ahead and mathematically transform the Fourier plane, and once you have all these components, you can get the image back. Yeah, obviously, if you could have one whole mirror, it would be better. You could have your image faster, you wouldn't have to do this whole mathematical transformation. So you do lose, but that's impossible, right? You just, that's not a choice you have. We cannot have one antenna that's 100 meters, and we, we will never be able to do that, regardless of the technology. That's just the physics, the, the physics limitation is that you cannot have that. So the next best thing is to have an interferometer, is to have this. And this actually allows you to have 
these monstrous, these enormous virtual antennas. Imagine that when Alma will be fully ready, we will have baselines up to 15 kilometers. Right now, we're, in, we're pretty much in the middle of all of these antennas surrounding us, and the antennas right now are configured, they're, they're all assembled in what we call the compact array. So, uh, really, all of the antennas are within 500 meters of each other. So, if you look around, you'll see that there's some antennas that are really close, and some that are about 100 meters away, and there's a couple that are a few hundred meters away, so they're all within 500 meters of each other. And that's actually pretty close for ALMA. And, and if you also look carefully, you'll notice that there are some antennas antennas that there are some pads, some foundations that do not have an antenna on it. So it turns out that ALMA um, will be able to change its configuration, right? It won't have this fixed set of all the antennas are here and they're not moving forever. They will be able to change its configurations because we have about three times more pads, more places where you can put antennas than we have antennas. We have about 200 pads and 60 antennas. And so that means that eventually um, ALMA is going to be able to, depending on the, uh, the scientific goals, what you want to really do, we will be able to change the configuration to match the scientific purpose of, of the observations. You know, they may not look like it, but in and of themselves, they're a piece of technology, right? They had to be built with a certain amount, with a very, very high set of uh, specification, right? They have to have a certain amount of flatness. Um, the position of those three, uh, we, we call them bread loaves. Uh, I think they have a more technical name, but those three bread loaves, they, this is what receives the antenna. When the antenna is being put down, they have an anti-bread loaf and the antenna gets put down on, on it. Um, the position of them has to be very accurate and it also has to have a, a certain amount of stiffness to it because the antennas are these 130 ton monsters and they're moving really fast, so they produce a big amount of torque on the, on the, on the, on the pad. So they have to have a certain amount of stiffness. And, and of course, inside the pads, what you don't see is that we have cables going into it to provide power to the antennas. So each of the antennas is powered. Uh, there's a vault there that we open. And to provide, obviously, the, the connection back to the correlator. One thing that you don't see is you don't see rails and you don't see any system to move them around. So we move them around with what we call a transporter. Oh, there we go. Yeah, well, so we're lucky that we just actually have right up here a transporter. There's two of them. Uh, I don't know what this one is called, but they're called Odo and Lore. Um, they were built in Germany by a German company. They're these big 28-wheel uh, by 28-wheel big machines that essentially can come and pick up the antenna, put it on its back, and move it around. And the goal is that you can not only move it around from the AOS from this location onto another pad in this location, but you can also bring it down to the OSF, to the, the location at 3,000 meters, where there we can do more heavy maintenance and change and repair parts. We, uh, we went out a few kilometers away from the main array that we can see over there. And, um, and so now we can have a kind of a global view of the whole area. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong and actually does go wrong and our job is to fix it.